Today's message, taken from Romans 7, I've entitled, The Battle That Can Be Won. The Battle That Can Be Won. Taken from Romans chapter 7, verses 14 to Romans 8, verse 2, which we've already, already um, has, been, has been read to us, so we're not going to go back and, and read that again. Romans, in Romans 7, Paul ends, and he uses a word to describe himself. The word is a wretch, W-R-E-T-C-H, calls himself a wretch. We find that word in the hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wretch is one of those words that kind of sounds like what it means, wretch or wretched. It, it, it's even ugly to say, isn't it? You wouldn't normally call somebody a wretch. That would be a pretty, pretty strong insult to call somebody a wretch or a wretched person. But here we find two people who in the prime of their adult ministry use this term to describe themselves. And perhaps this will help us understand Romans chapter 7. A little, a little bit about John Newton, if I may. He was the author of the hymn Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. And he wrote... This wonderful hymn, Amazing Grace, How Sweet That Sound to Save a Wretch Like Me. Some today want to take the word wretch out and put in a calmer word, but that would do disservice to John Newton. He wrote that word very carefully, describing himself. He was was a wretched person. He was the son of a sea captain who... Wanted to join the Navy, but he was such a bad person, the British Navy kicked him out. John Newton said of himself, it was my goal in life to make every person worse by having conversed with me. This was the nature of his own sinfulness. He ended up in West Africa working for a slave trader, but he was such an evil person that he ended up himself working in a plantation as a slave. He escaped this island of slavery in 1747 and got on a ship. During a storm on the ship, he was drunk, and the storm threw him overboard. Another sailor to rescue his life literally harpooned him and pulled him back onto the ship with a harpoon, which nearly took his life. While recovering from the harpoon incident, he was reminded of the scripture in Thomas Akempis' uh, book, The Imitation of Christ. His mother had prayed for his salvation for years. And somewhere in that time of his life, John Newton, the wretch, turned to Jesus Christ and found his grace amazing enough to save a wretch like him. The Apostle Paul, before his conversion, we know, is a terrible man, a persecutor of Christians, a blasphemous man, an angry man, as he describes himself. Somehow, both of these men, as adult Christians, spoke of their own personal wretchedness. Perhaps this morning, put up on the slide here is for you, the awareness of the utter sinfulness of sin is a mark of maturity. I don't know, perhaps when I was younger, I didn't think myself that bad. I heard people give testimonies of how God saved them from terrible lives, and I didn't have a testimony of great terribleness. Maybe I should have gotten saved later so I could have had a better testimony, I used to think. Maybe you thought that if you came to Christ as a child. But the older I've become in my faith, the more mature I've become in my understanding of salvation. I've realized what a great sinner I both was and could have been and still struggle with sin in my life. The denial of sin's pervasiveness is a sign of immaturity. Someone who thinks they aren't that bad of a sinner doesn't understand sin. Sin is pervasive. Sin is a poison that affects everything it touches. A pure glass of water with one dot, one drip of poison in it, you wouldn't drink it because the poison pervades the entire glass. Thus is the nature of sin. 
It poisons everything it touches. Romans 7, I think, is a wake-up call to those of us who think the Christian life is just all sweetness and light. What a great thing it is to be a Christian, and it's just a nice, easy road. Apparently, Paul and John Newton didn't think so. Apparently, they both struggled with sin throughout their life. Sometimes what I do and what I want to do is, is attention. I, I, I know what I want to do, but I, I, I don't do what I want to do. There's, there's a tension between the two, a wrestling with sin. One day the conflict will be over, but for now, we need a moment-by-moment rescue by the Lord Jesus Christ. I think Paul wrote this chapter to prove the law cannot rescue us. We saw that last Sunday. The law cannot rescue anybody. Then he continues to remind us that only through Christ are we rescued. In Romans chapter 7, the law is mentioned 35 times. The Spirit's only mentioned once. Romans 8 refers to the Holy Spirit more than 20 times, and the law only four times. Some people think that Romans 7 is, is, is Paul before he was a Christian. Romans 8 is Paul after he was a Christian because in Romans 7 he's trying to keep the law. In Romans 8 he's free from the law. I've taught that. Then there are those that think that Romans 7 is a mature Paul struggling with sin and acknowledging, letting us know that in spite of this struggle, it's the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God in us. It's the person of Christ that makes the difference in this battle. However you want to view Romans 7, either Paul pre-conversion or post-conversion, the message of these verses applies to us today. We're going to walk through Romans 7, 14 to chapter 8, verse 2. Uh, I, my own opinion is that the, the chapter division of Romans 7 and Romans 8 is the worst chapter division in the whole Bible. <laughs> it wasn't written that way. It was put there later so we could find our place in the Bible. But what a terrible place for a chapter division. You'll, we'll see that. So we're going to go all the way from chapter 7, verse 14, into chapter 8 and verse 2. We're going to look at seven points here, walking through the passage together. What I want you to understand is the Christian life is a struggle. It is a battle, but it's a battle that can be won. Many of us here struggle with sin, if not all of us. Some chapters of our life are a greater struggle than other chapters of our life. We're not alone in this struggle. But it's a battle that can be won. We see in verse 14, first of all, we often do what we hate. We do what we hate. Notice Paul's words. For we know that the law is spiritual. But I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want. But I do the very thing I hate. We often do what we hate. The problem is not that the demands of the law are too great, but that our human nature is too weak. The power of sin in our life is is too great. The power of sin is often too pervasive and too perverse. It seems sometimes, no matter how well-intentioned we are, we still fail to maintain the full demands of the law. We recognize this. We know what the law says. We know what Jesus taught about the law. Jesus didn't abolish the law. He raised it. You say you shouldn't shouldn't commit adultery. I say to you, don't lust after a woman. You've committed it in your heart. He didn't abolish it. He raised it. By nature, we studied in Romans 3 that we're sinful. In and of ourselves, we can't do anything good. Even the good we do sometimes is motivated for our own benefit. Interesting verse in Proverbs 21.4 says the plowing of the wicked is sin. Boy, I struggled with that, understanding that for a long time. There's no more honest work than farming. Some of you grew up on farms. It's hard work. You're up early. You stay up late. You're working the fields. It's, a, it's, a, it's hard labor. How could Solomon write the plowing of the wicked is sin? 
until I understood the motivation behind the plowing. The motivation behind the farmer is that he would have a good life. The motivation for his farming is for his own betterment, ultimately. Sure, he wants to take care of his family, but he wants his family to like him. His motivation is selfish. And many of the good things we do in life, because our motivation is selfish, even our good things we do are often sinful because they're selfish. The righteous desires, even, are met with the sinful selfishness of our flesh. And quite frankly, our flesh resists doing anything purely. Ever been accused of being selfish because the other person was selfish? And they accuse you, well, you must have an ulterior motive. It's the nature of our hearts. We say things, we do things because we want something in return. And Paul says, I do what I hate. We see secondly in verse 16, we do what we hate because of sin that dwells in us. Verse 16, now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. It is sin within us. That sin that dwells in us, we do what we hate because of the sin. Paul knew the law of God. Paul knew it was good. We saw that last week. The law is holy and righteous and good. As a Pharisee, Paul knew the law was good. He knew God was good. He knew, he, he knew that God gave his law to his people, but he could never live in submission to it. We can understand Paul's sinfulness here, and we can even say, in my flesh nothing good dwells. Things that come out of our mouth that we're ashamed of. Things we long after that we wouldn't share with anybody else. Things we do intentionally by ourselves because we don't want anybody else to see what we're doing. And Paul says, nothing in my flesh, nothing good dwells. This is what he's speaking to. I used to think as a young Christian that one day I would finally get over all of this stuff and I'd finally do better until I began to live my Christian life and meet Christians much older than me, those who had walked with Christ for 50, 60, 70 years, and they would tell me still of their struggles with sin in their heart. Within us, nothing good dwells. Throughout our life, the flesh is our enemy. Selfish, self-willed, we're critical, we're prideful, we're quick to anger, we're unmerciful, we're covetous, we're lustful. And we have to say with Paul, nothing good dwells in my flesh. Given the right situation, any of us are capable of any sin. Given the right situation, we are capable. This is the flesh within us. We see in verse 18, the third point, we always desire to do what is good and right. But we cannot always do it. We desire to do what's right. We know what's right. We know what's good. We've studied wisdom. We know the end of direction, the end of our actions. We know what is good and right. We desire that. But we just cannot always do what is right. Verse 18, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Could any of you have written those verses? Could this be part of your diary some days? Verse 20, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. I believe in Christ. We desire what is right. We desire to live out the righteousness of Christ within us. We desire this. We've studied imputed righteousness of Christ. We know we have an alien righteousness, not our own within us. And then we go home and struggle with doing what is right. In fact, some days we do the work of God and we feel prideful. 
Suddenly we're in sin because we take it upon ourselves. Well, we want to serve God, but our flesh is lazy. I don't want to get up early. I don't want to give of myself. I don't want to give of my time. I'm not feeling it today. We want to give to God, but we feel covetous. Sure, I'd like to help this person, but you know, I'm saving money to buy this for myself. And covetousness overcomes the purity of our heart to give. Even the good we want to do is often met with some sinful resistance. It's going to cost me more than I want in one part of my life or another. Even for those of us who are justified, we possess the imputed righteousness of Christ. Sin is still within us, and we struggle. This does not mean we are not justified. We are justified. But there's a battle of our sinful human desires. And what Paul is saying here, that apart from Christ, this battle cannot be won. If you try to live the Christian life on your own, you cannot live it. If you try to follow the law without Christ, it is utterly impossible. Only in Christ is it a battle that can be won. Think with me about the Apostle Peter for a moment. Jesus said to Peter, you're going to deny me three times. What did Peter say? Uh Uh-uh. No no way, no how. Ain't happening. That's my version. No way. God, I don't care if the whole world denies you. You can take it to the bank. I am not going to be the one to deny you. How like Peter are we? Good intention. Solid intention. But the moment our faith is attacked, terrible things come out of our mouths. Incredible doubts we thought could never exist within us surface. All of us have doubted God as his children, as followers of him. God, why would you do this to me? Just give me back what I had. I want normal. I don't want the new normal. I want the old normal. And you can fix it. Just fix it. Our faith is cracked, sometimes shattered. And that which we thought we would never do, we find ourselves saying. The fourth point in verse 21 is there is a law of sin still in us. Now, this is a point that some would say is debatable, but just hear me out. Verse 21, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Before we were justified, before we had the imputed righteousness of Christ within us, we did not have any delight in God's law. We didn't care at all for the things of God. Church meant nothing. Christian music meant nothing. Christian involvement meant nothing to us. There was no spiritual desire. But now in Christ, we are aware of the law of the spirit of life in us. us. And we, we, we know we do battle against the law of sin and death. And the law of sin still wants to make us prisoners, does it not? I often get asked the question, Pastor, what about a person who gets saved but then goes off into sin and they die? Are they still going to heaven? Well, based on justification, absolutely, they're still saved. But the truth of the matter is, we struggle because sin still wants to control us. We have the victor in us. In those moments of weakness, sin wants to control us. I knew a pastor, good man, had a physical problem, living with constant pain. He began to drink a little bit just to ease his pain. Before long, he was drinking alcohol too much. 
His congregation found him home drunk one day. He would never have become an alcoholic, but in a moment of physical pain, it overtook him. Is it possible for us to still fall under sin's controls? I think so. The law of sin still wants to make us prisoners of sin. When we sin and, and when we sin and, and sin seems to win in our hearts, we exclaim to God our own wretchedness. God, it's me again. Here I am again. I, I know I was here last week or last month and last year, and here I am again. And we proclaim to God our own wretchedness. We sometimes feel like we're still a slave to sin. It's not where we want to live. We want to be a slave to God's righteous law. We want our bodies to be used as instruments of His. Remember the instrument illustration of the guitar. The guitar is a neutral instrument until it's picked up and played. God wants to use us as His instruments of His righteousness in this life. But sin wants to take these same instruments and use them as instruments of sin. And then enslave us. We see in verse 24, the fifth point here. We need a deliverer to deliver, to deliver us from this body of death. We need a deliverer. We can't do it. Do you agree with me on that? How many of you have made lists of things you were never going to do again only to find yourself doing them? You've promised God, God, I will never do this again only to find yourself doing it. What do we need? A deliverer. Verse 24, a wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Let me take a moment and explain this sentence. Paul used an expression here that all of his readers understood, though it's a bit lost to us. There's a particular <clears throat> Roman consequence to a murderer that was particularly gruesome. It's even hard for us to imagine this punishment. But if you were found guilty of murder, the Roman soldiers might take the body of the person you killed and chain it to you, face to face, hand to hand, leg to leg. And you would carry that dead body with you. At first, you might be able to talk. Before long, you wouldn't be able to talk anymore. At first, you might be able to carry and be a part of your family, but before long, the stench of the dead body on you, nobody want to be around you. You may be able to carry that dead body around a while or be able to sleep once in a while with it, but before long, you could no longer carry it. That dead body would take your strength. As that dead body decayed, it would begin to decay your skin. As you inhaled the fumes of death into your body, before long, your lungs would be overtaken by that breath of death and take your life. As Paul wrote this, he said, who can deliver me from this flesh, this body of death attached to me? Isn't that a graphic picture? Think about your old flesh strapped to you. The old flesh that still wants to sin, that still is controlled and consumed by sin. Think about that body of death still strapped to you, dragging you down, taking you away from people that you love, taking away your strength, and ultimately killing your very spiritual life. Paul says, who can deliver me from the body of this death? Then he proclaims a wonderful statement, doesn't he? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Paul says, I do not live attached to that body. Now in my mind, in my heart, I am living for the Lord Jesus Christ.
it's a battle we can't separate ourselves from, but our deliverer can. No flesh can get away from this battle. None of us are neutral observers to this battle. It's not a game we watch and enjoy and see who wins or loses. We are, we are participants in this battle. Strangely, our heart finds itself on both sides. Our heart is torn by the division. Some days we want the sin. We want the right to sin. We want to, made, we want to be made to feel good about ourselves. And whatever it, that activity is that makes us feel good about ourselves, our heart wants it. At the very same time, our heart wants to please the Lord. And we have this struggle between the two. The heart is often torn by the division. So Paul cries out, there is nothing good in me. Who can deliver me? But then he sings, thanks for the hope of liberation that comes through Jesus Christ. A simple illustration of this can be the law of gravity. How many of you are chained by the law of gravity? The fact you're sitting in a chair proves you are chained to the law of gravity. How many of you have gotten into a, into a tube full of chairs and that tube became, overcame the laws of gravity and carried you and your chair under the law of gravity way up into the sky? It's called the law of aerodynamics. The right amount of thrust, the right amount of lift enables a heavier an air craft to overcome for a while the law of gravity. Is the airplane still under the law of gravity when it's in the air? In a sense, yes. But in another sense, no. Because the laws of aerodynamics are keeping it in the air. Kind of like the law of sin within us doesn't stop. But the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus makes us free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death doesn't leave us alone. It is still there. We are able to live above it, to win these battles spiritually in our hearts, because there's a greater law that takes control. The greater law is the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. He who crushed the serpent's head now lives in us. He who wears the victor's crown is now in us. We don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. He has already gained the victory, and he is in us. And so we see number six in Christ. We never need to worry about the condemnation of the law. We are set free in him. How much condemnation can the law put upon you? Are you with me? How much condemnation can the law place upon you? Do you keep the law perfectly? When you break the law, can the law condemn you? Please answer correctly. No. The law can no longer condemn you. Because those who are in Christ Jesus, there is what? No condemnation. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus now sets us free from the law of sin and death. This is why this is a terrible place for a chapter break. We need Romans 8, 1, and 2 to finish Romans 7. All of the frustration, all of the Christian battle of the Christian life, the battle of the non-believer, the battle of the believer trying to make it work, the only answer is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that sets us free from the law of sin and death. <clears throat> Perhaps I can illustrate this from a, uh, my, my newfound hobby of, of scuba diving. Before I could continue on to the next level of certification, I had to do a night dive. Now, when the sun sets over the ocean, the water's dark. There are no lights in the ocean at night. There's no street lights. There's no cafe lights on. There, contrary to the cartoons of Under the Sea, there's no lights down there. It's dark. 
And so you, you go underwater in the darkness and you carry two torches because in case one goes bad, you have a backup. That's a requirement. I appreciate that requirement. But we got down maybe, maybe 10 meters, and the instructor said to us, turn off your lights. So we dutifully obeyed and turned off, our, turned off our lights. Man, was it dark. Like panic dark, right? Like, where's my button? i got to turn this thing back on. I don't like it being dark down here. Turn, you turn your torch back on and it lights up and you can see everything again. And night diving is amazing because without the light of the sun, only the light of your flashlights, the colors are more brilliant. The, the, the reality of the colors and the coral and the fish, it's just brilliant. It is absolutely amazing to do night diving. But when we, get, we got our pictures and videos back from the dive and I began to look at them, then I realized very quickly that just outside of, just outside of the beam of our light, the ocean is pitch black. Kind of a picture to me of the Christian life. Sin is not very far away from me. The light of Christ guides me. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Those who walk with me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. How far away is that darkness? Just turn the light off for a second. It's not very far. Some of you walk into a dark office every day. You're the only light that's there. Some of you walk into a dark home. You're the only Christian in your family. You're the only light that walks in there. And you know that that darkness is pretty close all the time. Paul said it's okay. Because the law of the spirit and life in Christ Jesus sets you free from the law of sin and death. That law of darkness that wants to consume you cannot. The darkness of the ocean cannot consume us when our lights are on. We know exactly where we are. We know how to get out and where to go as long as we have the light. As long as we have Christ. We are able to win the battle of this world. Finally, number seven, while living in this life, the power of the Holy Spirit in us enables us to overcome, to live above the law of sin that plagues us. Remember we said Romans 7 was a, was a chapter on sanctification. Sanctification is growing in holiness, growing in life change. Yes, we struggle with sin, but we don't want to live there. We want to live in the light, not the darkness. We don't want an excuse for it either. And some might use Romans 7 as an excuse. Well, I can't help but sin. Don't use it as an excuse. Use it as a step in your sanctification. God, who do you want me to become? Who do you want me to be? Let's go to the next slide. Christ is in us. We can live above the law of sin. As we live in the Spirit and in the Word, worshiping the Father, this is a battle that can be won. Brothers and sisters, we need God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We need the Word of God to be consumed into our hearts and minds. We need the Spirit of God to take the Word of God and confirm its truth to our minds. So that when we face the darkness of this world, when we face the temptations of our flesh, we have an anchor. We have a truth source. We have a light source that never goes out. We have a place to go to gain that victory. Not because we're feeling like a good day, but because we're standing on truth that doesn't change. Our feet were in the miry clay. But he has taken us and set our feet upon a rock. He has given us a new way to walk. He has put a new song in our mouth, even praise to our God. We no longer have to live in, that, in that, that, that darkness of Romans 7. As Paul cries out, O wretched man that I am, you may cry out, O wretched man, O wretched woman that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? And we can say, thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. My flesh still wants to serve sin, but I no longer need to live there because the law of the Spirit and life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin. And
death. Let's pray together. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the the sin conqueror. You completely lived the law in this life, though you were in a body of flesh. You overcame every temptation. And now you make intercession for us. Not only are you our example, but you are our empowerment. From victory, you call us to walk in your light. Father, while we struggle, as Paul did, as John Newton did, as we often recognize our own wretchedness, we are so thankful that you have saved us from that condition. You have given us a new life and a new light. Lord, help us to not excuse our sin. Help us to hate our sin. Help us to walk with you every day, to be in your word, to allow your spirit to lead us by that word. Help us to see where sin always takes us and to avoid it, that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus might every day set us free from the law of sin and death. Thank you, Lord, that you saved us forever, but you also have given us life to live now. You said, I came that you would have life eternal and life abundant. Well, we want that life abundant today. As a church, as a body of believers, brothers and sisters in Christ here in this building today, we want to know not just eternal life, but life abundant in Christ. Lord, may we recognize the enemy within us. And we call it for what it is. And may we faithfully... Walk in your light, we pray in your name. Amen.